thank you, Oscar, for the introduction, and you all, thank you for being here. I know it has been a tough few days partying and working, and uh, well, uh, it's going to be a tough crowd, I think. Um, I actually get a lot of questions about mobile advertising and mobile user acquisition, and I thought it was a good idea to just run through the basics. Um, it used to be easy to make games. You just made a game and you launched it, and maybe you were a success. And these days, it's actually getting more and more difficult because if you look at what you have to do as a developer, it's not just building a game. You need to have analytics, mobile user acquisition, uh, scalability, uh, in-game economy. And actually, we're setting up a series of uh, talks about what kind of tools do you have and do you need to master to become uh, successful. And actually, I wanted to start with the first one, which is obvious because I work for Chartboost, which is actually a, a mobile advertising network. And uh, that's about mobile advertising. First, a little bit about myself. Oscar already said it. I've been in games since 1999. That's when I released my first game. And since then, I've seen a, oh, uh, since then I've seen a huge um, a change in how games are built, how they're monetized, and how they're distributed. And actually, um, I launched my first mobile game in 2001. That was on iMode, which was actually the predecessor of the current mobile web. Um, then in 2006, uh, I moved to free-to-play browser games, and in 2009, uh, I launched my first mobile game on uh, iOS, which was a pay-to-play, and I know it's hard to understand that these days people make, still make pay-to-play games, but I still do believe in pay-to-play. And since 2011, I'm working on this um, free-to-play mobile game um, with a focus on tablet. And this is what I do next to my work at Chartboost, and I hope to launch the game in the first quarter of next year. Then first question I ask myself is actually, what is advertising? Um, well, we advertise um, products or services to be known to the audience, and most of the time it's, it's a, it has a commercial purpose. And I think it's a very old concept. I have did some research, and you see that the Romans actually were doing it I think thousands of years ago, they were using the walls, they made graffiti to actually announce political events and gatherings, and even for the um, gladiator fights in the Colosseum. It wasn't very effective, you don't know how many people see it, and that's why I uh, wanted to point out the two other uh, examples. The first one is Pierce, that's actually a soap company from the beginning of last century. They did something that's called saturation marketing, which is still used by a lot of companies. They wanted to be everywhere. They just used every outing they could get uh, to show their name, to show their slogan, and to make sure that everybody heard of Pierce uh, Soap. And I think this is a, a method that can work, but it's still uh, hard to measure the effect. In 1923, um, a guy called Hodgkin, he actually did research on scientific marketing, so he had a totally different approach. And remember, this is almost 100 years ago. He started publishing advertisements in all kinds of magazines and newspapers, and he actually all gave all um, the different outings a unique number, so he could track the uh, conversion of these uh, advertisements. And if you look at um, the performance, he actually could measure different headers, slogans, placements, and based on this, he could actually start optimizing um, his commercials. And I think this is something that we're doing now with mobile advertising uh, a lot better. You can actually track uh, where your user's coming from, um, what they're doing, and so you can spend more wisely. So for me, the methodologies are still the same, but actually the channels are uh, changing. Then the big question you ask yourself is uh, why advertising? Um, if you look at the current state of the app market, every day 150 games are released in the app store. That means that about 40% growth year over year on games. So it's an incredible growth of games in all the app markets. And then if you look at the app uh, top grossing 25 in, in iTunes, only 2% are newcomers. So it means that the, by far the majority of the uh, game developers in the top grossing are actually the same. So it's pretty hard to get into this level of, uh, of uh, the, the charge. 
So we talked a little bit about uh, advertising, and I think I want to uh, uh, take the parallel to mobile advertising. If you look at the usage on mobile these days, that's incredible. Um, this is research uh, a few months ago on the US market. At this point in time, 50% of the people in the US have a smartphone, and they, act, uh, um, they interact with it for 141 minutes per day. So that's almost two and a half hours of usage of your mobile phone, which is incredible. Um, on the mobile ad spend, and this is not just related to games, but it's also related to other uh, uh, brands and apps, um, they spent eight billion on, uh, in dollars uh, in the US alone in the last year. And then uh, at, if you look at the mobile usage, 80% of the time spent on mobile usage is actually on apps. So what does it relate to with games? 62% um, of the people who have a phone play games, and they are actually playing games for 32% of the time, and I did some quick math, and that's actually three quarters of an hour on average. So 62% of the people who have an iPhone or uh, another smartphone play games for 45 minutes. So this is the audience you actually need to reach. They're dedicated, uh, they're willing to spend, uh, and, uh, and they need to play your game. And if you look at the total app ecosystem, 80% of the revenue comes from the games. So it's definitely worth investing in trying to find the users because they're willing to spend money on it. And if you look at mobile game advertising, it's very effective. Um, it's 30 times more effective than regular online um, uh, campaigns. The click-through rate is 30 times higher. So then there's $260 million uh, spent last year on user acquisition in mobile. So that's an incredible amount. And if you look at the top, um, it's, it's not many companies spending at this point in time, but there's definitely an opportunity for, uh, for the smaller developers to get into this market as well. Then we have the publishers who actually make money on this advertising. And uh, on average, 6% uh, of the money uh, earned by game developers is coming from ad revenue. And that's definitely increasing. Of course, in-app purchases is by far the majority. But that's only a small percentage of the developers are making their, game, m their money on, on uh, in-app purchases. A lot of them are actually making money on ad revenue. And then the campaigns that they're running, sustainment is the most popular. I'll get back to the types of campaigns you can run later. So if you're considering advertising, you should define a goal for yourself, because what do you want to achieve? Um, then based on the goal, you actually uh, have to create campaigns, find your channels, run the campaign, and then do the metrics, analyze them, optimize them, and maybe adjust your goals. So I'm going through the different stages of this, uh, this uh, circle. And first, it's, it's your goal. Actually, these goals are types of campaigns that are f more frequently used. Um, what we see now at Chartboost is that you see a lot of test campaigns. So people launch their game in a certain territory, and they have different purposes. The first one is actually to see if the mechanics are working. A game designer has an idea, and he wants to know, do the people play the game um, as I think he should? And then you also want to know if there's no bugs in the game. But uh, last but not least, you, uh, you want to try and establish a lifetime value. So what is the user going to spend over the lifetime of his gameplay? Because then you can actually say, OK, if a, if a user is worth $1, if I spend under $1 on, a, on user acquisition, I still make money. And that's, in the end, the goal we're having is making money on our games. Then we have the launch campaign, which is basically, OK, I tested my game. It's working. I'm ready. I'm going out there. And I decide on some territories for the uh, uh, for the game to where I think it has potential, and you start advertising in these campaign, uh, these territories, and you do your user acquisition. I think the previous speaker talked a little bit about the burst campaigns. I'm not a strong believer in burst campaigns because what it does, it it gives you a chart position, um, but you need to maintain it afterwards. People say that there's organic uh, traffic coming from a chart position, but in the end, your game needs to be good anyway. And I don't know if reaching the chart position um, is the only goal. Uh, I'm more a guy who grows the game in a steady way with quality users than trying to use incentivized traffic or app gratis and, and boost your campaign. And then afterwards, you see a hard drop because the users are not valuable. Then re-engagement. I think this is something that for a lot of users is very important, and we're not really focusing on it yet as uh, 
it's not really user acquisition, but it's targeting players that have been playing your game before, have spent money, used to be engaged with your game, and they left. So you need to identify them, need to find the channels where they are now, and actually notify them that you've made changes or an update, or you have to convince them by giving away prizes or something special in the game. And I think this is something that some companies, and we too, are now trying to find out what's the best way actually to re-engage with your users. And this can be done by running campaigns in other games, but also, for example, push notifications are a great way to do this. And then sustain. Uh, a metric is actually the churn in, in, in uh, uh, mobile gaming. That means how many uh, players do drop off and how many players do I need to gain every day to have a sustainable level of, of players. And this is something that uh, Chartboost provides. Um, we actually are a long tail solution where you can uh, provide quality users. So we're more focused on uh, getting the right users for your game and make sure that you keep the same level of user acquisition uh, uh, week over week. Then if you look at your campaign, I made this slide because this is something that puts a lot of people off. There are so many metrics these days that you have to measure. Uh, only at user acquisition and then you have your conversion, your retention, uh, the user behavior. And I think this is something that scares a lot of people. And um, actually you should focus on a few metrics for your user acquisition. That's basically your CPI, which is the cost per install. So what do you actually pay for an install uh, for, from your game? So basically, what do you pay for a user? Then you need to know the lifetime, because actually, if you look at the lifetime, of your, uh, lifetime value of a user, you know what you can spend to acquire a user. And then you have the K factor. And I think the K factor is the most uh, yeah, uh, abstract uh, factor, but that's basically uh, people call the K factor how the virality. So if one user um, is bought, so you do user acquisition for one user, how many users brings he in organically? Um, good example is King. I think they are very good. <laughs> they have a very high K factor. Um, they are very capable of buying one user and knowing that he actually brings in a certain amount of other users. You shouldn't expect like uh, factors that one user gets one organic user. It's always lower. Um, uh, people talk about K factors between uh, 0.3 and 0.5, and I think then you're very successful. But this is something that's very uh, important to actually do the metrics and calculate what you can spend on a user acquisition. Then there's the different media types. And this is something that you as a game developer has to choose. Uh, why do I use banners or why do I use uh, video? And I, I just run quickly through them and have some pros and cons. And actually, I split them in two here because you have the advertiser and you have the publisher. So I quickly will mention some uh, pros for the advertiser and also for the publisher because I think it's very important as an advertiser that you also keep the publisher in mind who's actually going to show you, sh show your ads and make sure that you have the inventory to buy the users. So we used banners in the beginning. Um, I think uh, what we've noticed is that uh, an interstitial is 20 times more as effective as a banner, but the banner def definitely has some benefits. That's basically, that's a very high fill rate. You, as a publisher, will always have inventory, so you will always able to show ads. It's very simple to integrate. Um, it's a dedicated position in the in, in the game, so you will always have a position and you will always be visible, and that also means that they're auto-refreshing, so you don't have to actually call the server every time, automatically you will update uh, the content. As an advertiser, I think there's some downsides. Um, you have limited design uh, capabilities. Um, there's low quality users, so the user from that you acquire through a banner seems a bit lower than other means. Um, you have a very high frequency as a as a publisher, so if I'm playing a game and I see this banner on underneath under in my game refreshing constantly, I get annoyed. And um, the eCPM is very low, so as a publisher, you don't make a lot of money on the banners, so you have them show them uh, to show them a lot of times. The design options are actually changing. There's a Dutch company I've just seen. They make uh, more rich media uh, banners. So it's basically a banner. You click on it, and then an interstitial opens. So it's definitely something that's evolving. But we'll have to see where that goes. Then interstitials. This is something we do. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm biased. So, uh, But I really believe in interstitials. Why? Because it's a high-quality graphic, so you are 
way better able to show what the game does. Um, you get high quality users. Again, uh, integration is simple. And the, the cons are actually that some people find it intrusive because you get a banner which is full screen. It is an overlay over your full game and that makes it that you have to click it away so you can't ignore it. At the other hand, the frequency is lower so you don't have to show like 20 in a, in a session. You only do once or twice during a session so th there's a balance. Video is upcoming. We get a lot of uh, requests for video and I think it's a very good medium. Um, it's high visibility. You actually are able to show gameplay. This results in very high quality users. Biggest downside is the, the production cost. And for a publisher, there's basically no fill rate out of sight of USA. So if you're having a game which is popular in the USA, you definitely will be able to show game videos. But for other territories, it's, uh, there's not that much content. Then this is not a media type because all banners, uh, video, and um, uh, uh, the, the interstitials can be incentivized. But I'm not a big fan. Uh, why? Um, this is mainly to reach a chart position. Uh, if you look at the quality of the user, actually the user is installing a game because he gets something in return. He's not installing the game because he wants to play your game. And I think this is something which is re really important to consider when using incentivized traffic. What do I want to achieve? If you want to buy quality users, I would never suggest to use incentivized traffic because probably they won't re-engage with your game and they won't start spending money. If you really want to build awareness and user base and chart position, then you definitely can use incentivized traffic because it's relatively cheap and um, you get really high volume quickly. By far the most important, it's not user acquisition in the sense that you can buy it, but organic traffic, I think people underestimate the power of what you can have by being, being uh, actually reviewed, blog post, uh, create a buzz around your game, because the users you'll get organically are by far the most valuable. They will be more likely to re-engage, to spend money, and actually also to increase the K factor, because if I play a game that I found, I'm gonna tell my friends and I'm gonna invite them to play the same game. And of course, the Holy Grail is getting featured, but there's no recipe for being featured. This is the thing that m is most scary, I think, for most developers at the moment, is there's so many ch uh, channels out there that you can use to do user acquisition. Um, this is just like a top of the iceberg, so to speak. Uh, I try to divide them into some uh, different channels, but some have an overlap. But if you look at agencies, they're more for the larger gaming companies. So if you don't have the time and the resources and you're willing to spend more on user acquisition because they take a percentage on the, on the uh, CPI you're bidding, um, then you can use an agency. So some agencies um, are more clever because they use data more wisely to buy, z buy users more wisely. So they definitely have an advantage. But I think it's very important as a game developer to understand um, what you're doing with user acquisition. Because some people don't know what they're doing. They leave it up to an agency. But I think it's very important that you understand to learn these metrics and actually do it yourself. Then you have ad exchanges, which is basically they do mediation. So they plug in all kinds of ad networks and they actually do the mediation for you. Downside is that you don't have any transparency over what is shown in your game and as an advertiser that where your ads will be shown. But at the other hand, you'll be, uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I missed you. I didn't make the slide. Sorry, Oscar. I missed, I missed Oscar. So, um, and then there's the networks. Um, tracking, this is something that from the last uh, well, 12 to 18 months, I think this is something that came up very rapidly. That's third-party tracking software like uh, Hasovers, mobile app tracking, Apps Flyer, AdEx. What they do is actually, you see that a lot of uh, game developers spend over 40 networks. So they use 40 different ad networks to acquire users. And you want to know the return of investment from every network. So these third-party tracking solutions create one dashboard which will give you insight in, OK, where did I buy a user? What did I spend them in? What did I get back for it? So you're better able to optimize. Whoa, I'm out? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm doing it quickly. I'm doing it quickly. So basically, you have to pay attention to your, uh, uh, is there a minimum spend? And I think it's also very important to look at the transparency and the control as an advertiser. Where do you show your ad, and how are you able to optimize? Uh, targeting. 
uh, devices, geolocation, these are very important targets. And then you also need to be able to a, B, test your creatives, and I think it's very important that you can actually adjust your creatives and have many different types. Measuring again, I think this is the slide, what's it all about? I, it's the same slide, but in the end it's about if your CPI cost, so the user acquisition cost times the K factor is lower than your lifetime value, you're making a profit. And I think that's something that you want to do as a game developer anyway, and then some key takeaways, but you can read it and Oscar can ask some questions. Absolutely. Thank, thanks, sir. Yeah. So obviously, we want questions, but I'm going to chuck in a few sort of arrows because I, I, uh, he missed us off. Uh, but I mean, you talked about video. Um, actually, we, we can find something like 90 to 95 fill rate in English-speaking territories and around 85% in non-English speaking. So there are, there are fill rate um, for video out there. Cost of production, though, I, I get that. Fair enough. Unless, of course, you use something like every player to record your game automatically, but that's me doing my plug. Um, but there was some interesting stuff there, I think, as well. Uh, you, you had Burstly within the sort of ad network area, and uh, I was wondering whether it's worth separating out the sort of mitigation, you know, the sort of um, uh, the mediation, mediation services. Mediation, yeah. that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Too, too not enough coffee. Mediation services from, every, from the sort of pure ad networks. You, is that worth Yeah, you're about? correct. So that's what I say. There's an overlap, so you can't put everyone in one single channel. But mediation layers are basically, yeah doing the mediation, they're optimizing your traffic as an advertiser and as a, as a, uh, a publisher. So what I say, that can be beneficial because as a publisher you will be get the most uh, money for your thousand impressions, but at the other hand you're not able to get transparency and have control over the inventory. And I think this is uh, you know, sort of key to sort of understand this space, is that we're making games first and foremost. So we have to entertain an audience. But we also need to make sure we make the most of that space. And some of that's going to be using advertising. Some of that's going to be using virtual goods. That's going to be it's, it's understanding the mix of the tools. And it's that data slide that you showed, understanding the data, that will really make a difference. And I, it was actually a Facebook person in uh, London that said to me, uh, well, said, said in her presentation, the key thing now is lifetime network value. It's not just about the lifetime value of the individual. It's the effect that their playing your game has on their network effect inside the game. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but I think it's a figure you can't track easily. Because how do you know what the network effect is? It's like a ripple in the water. I know it's important, but it's like the K factor. That's already difficult, but you can measure it. Because as a, a game developer, you, can, you have the tools to actually track, OK, this user brought in that user, and he brought in that user. But the network effect, and yeah, over time, and of course, Facebook can say this, because they have actually <laughs> excellent targeting methods. <laughs> but uh, for all this, I think it's harder to estimate this. I mean, that's, that does bring me, I mean, I, I mean, if you've got questions, by the way, interrupt me. Joel, Joel's got one. Uh, as the mic's going through, it does make me think about one of the key problems I think we have at the moment is that we now have data, but we don't necessarily always know the right questions to ask, and sometimes that data is hard to, uh, to find. So, for example, the consequences of our actions may not just be the net result, the, the measurable result. It might be the context which we've created. Well, it, I think you hit the nail on the head because it's not just measuring, it's interpreting the data. And what you see is that not many people have experience with data analysis specific, specifically for games and user acquisition, let alone only user behavior in the game is already difficult. And now mapping it out to user uh, acquisition. I mean, this is very complex. And what we see in the space is that people are actually uh, poached everywhere. <laughs> if you're a good data analyst or user acquisition manager, then well, you're guaranteed from a good job. I mean, that's uh, that's that's for sure. So, Joe. Hi. Oh, uh, yeah, Joe from Five Hundred Five Games. Actually, we put Chart Boost in all of our mobile games. So, great job you guys are doing. Just wonder if you have some a hot tip for you know the people that are here on some uh, some great test market uh, territories. Uh, from what you're you know seeing on the network so for instance Canada is a very popular one and the the bid prices get get racked way up you know as I'm sure you you know and Australia the same so I just wonder if you have some some uh, tips for some good territories that uh, we could test market in cool uh, I think we've got time for one more question after that by the way so yeah, I can, I can answer it quickly. The thing is, 
people dive into a test market, which drive the CPI up. So if you see Canada and Australia, the CPIs are very high. I mean, they're the highest over the whole world. So now you see people moving to Singapore and the Netherlands. Yeah. So it's, it's finding a balance between how many people do I want to buy, but you need to invest in these markets and you need to have a certain volume of users. So it's pretty hard, but you're right. I think Canada and Australia were by far the best, but now you see people moving to Singapore and the Netherlands. Okay. So then there's that last one question. Who wants to take that? Oh, this over here. The mic is coming. Hi, this is Bura from Peak Games. Um, despite the uh, growth of uh, video ads, um, marketers are still f uh, finding their ways about what is the effectiveness of videos and uh, what is the most uh, optimal length of video, both in uh, publisher and advertiser perspective. So uh, my question is about what is, what is the optimum length? Well, of course, we don't do video, but what I hear is that about 12 to 15 seconds is a maximum length for a video. Um, because that's, it also depends on how you bring it, because some people do incentivized video and you have to watch the whole video, which is very annoying because you can't click it away. But if you are uh, allowing the user to skip it, then it can be a bit longer. But I think 12 to 15 seconds is enough to show real something about your gameplay, and it's still not too intrusive so that it's too long and breaks the gameplay too much. But I think uh, he's better to answer Yeah, I mean, we do exactly that. Uh, at uh, every play, uh, sorry, at Applify we do game ads, and game ads um, tend to be 15, it can be up to 30 seconds, but 15 seems to be a sweet spot. Uh, and again, optimizing that. We, what we find though is that if you are going with the flow of the game and you say, okay, now I want free coins, well, you can get free coins by watching a video, then that kind of incentive, you get coins just for watching the video, not necessarily for doing the download. That seems to have a really good effect because you're not it's not just the money, it's about creating retention for the audience. Yeah, I think this is the fair thing to say about incentivized video, uh, incentivized traffic. If it's just about watching the video, then you create brand awareness. That's something else than buying a user by incentivized traffic. So yeah, I agree you're with this. That you're also creating long longevity for the free players because uh, as Char uh, Charles, uh, Charlie Chapman from um, uh, First Touch Games had a great quote on this, which is basically he doesn't do the video ads in order to necessarily get money, although he does. It's the effect it has on the long-term lifetime value of those free players. Thanks. Thanks, Ian.